why you were developing a magnetic stimulator, which I believed you actually developed to stimulate peripheral nerve. Why did you do that? Because we can stimulate peripheral nerve perfectly well with electricity. My PhD, which was from, I think it was 1973 to 1976, was looking at developing a technique to measure the distribution of conduction velocities in peripheral nerves. And one of the ways I could achieve the goal would have been if I could do what's called velocity selective stimulation of a mixed nerve. And in theory, faster fibers have lower thresholds, at least as an engineer, that's my understanding of them. And therefore, if one did a very weak stimulus, one would only stimulate the fastest fibers. It doesn't work in practice. And the reason I assumed it didn't work in practice was because the electrical stimulus that you're delivering through surface electrodes decreases with depth into the tissue. So I thought, well, how can one deliver stimuli that don't decrease with distance into the tissue? And it suddenly occurred to me that if one could put a uniform time varying magnetic field, the sort of thing we engineers work with, yeah. all the way through the tissue, it would essentially generate a uniform electric current all the way through the tissue and velocity selective stimulation might therefore yeah. occur. I started looking at magnetic stimulation of nerves in the periphery and it turned out to be rather more challenging than I had anticipated because the, the, the currents and the pulse durations that you had to put into the coil were quite demanding. I got to the stage that I had wound a coil on what you call a C core, it's an iron core essentially with a gap in it like a letter C and if I put my wrist in that gap I could just achieve sensory stimuli with all the technology oh. that was available to me. I could feel it quite distinctly, but couldn't get quite as far as muscular contraction. I decided that this was sufficiently challenging from an engineering point of view in those days, and just put magnetic stimulation to one side until I'd finished my PhD got a permanent job in the medical physics department of the Royal Hallamshire Hospital and as a almost as a hobby if you like I returned to magnetic <laughs> stimulation just out of pure academic scientific curiosity right. to see what properties it had. So presumably uh, you got Mike Bolson to, to, to do some of that for you is that right? In 1978, we got Mike Paulson as a PhD student, and he was tasked with producing a, a, a powerful enough stimulator that could stimulate peripheral nerves. At that time, you were trying to manufacture an electric pulse in, in tissue that was similar to the electric pulse that we use normally to stimulate nerves. Exactly so, because of course, Magnetic stimulation isn't really magnetic stimulation at all, even though I called it that, it's a misnomer. It's really electrical stimulation using the magnetic field as a vehicle to cause the currents to flow in the tissue. And it was pretty well established what was a good sort of pulse duration mm -hmm. to use for traditional electrical stimulation. So it made sense that we made a magnetic stimulator that was comparable in terms of induced waveform. Oh, so why did you then try to develop Another stimulate, another version of it, which I think Reza Jalinus was a PhD student yet again, uh, who, who did that. We did it largely because Mike Paulson's stimulator was quite limited in what it could do. It was very slow to charge up. It used a lot of electrical energy and it could only drive a relatively small coil that would stimulate a relatively superficial nerve. And so Reza was tasked with effectively re-engineering the system based on more recent technology that had come along. Um, so we thought, well, well, we'll just go bigger and stronger and better and make use of high voltage capacitors instead of the relatively low voltage electrolytics. Well, the coil was slightly bigger, was it? We were, we were always conscious that a small coil, the fields fall off relatively rapidly and you couldn't stimulate deep nerves. So if you wanted to, for example, stimulate lumbar roots or something like that, mm -hmm. Mike's little coil wouldn't have been very good for that, um, would have struggled. And the other advantage of a big coil is that 
it makes spatial positioning of the coil less critical because the current loops it induces the yeah. tissue are just physically larger. Now, all this was going on up there in Sheffield, and I presume you were aware of Merton's stimulation of the brain using his high voltage electric technique, which was about 1980, I think, um, was several years before Reza began his uh, uh, stimulator. So who made the connection between stimulating nerves and stimulating brains that finally resulted in you coming down to London and demonstrating uh, magnetic stimulation on the brain? As it happens, it, it was me. And it was like a light bulb moment for me. I can remember it vividly. I can even remember the room in, in the institution where it actually happened. And I suddenly thought, gosh, we have got a technology that potentially can do the same thing, but better, deeper, and painlessly, because you don't induce significantly larger currents in the scalp than you do in the brain. And so it didn't hurt. And so it was immediately obvious to I me, mean, literally in, in a fraction of a second, that we had a technology that could probably stimulate the brain. That's amazing. And so I believe you wrote to Merton then uh, and said, would you like to come up here or would you like us to go down there and try it out? Yes, I, I wrote saying that I read about his work and we had this induced current technology which we thought may have some significant benefits. Um, so I, I wrote to Pat Merton and, and said, well, you know, we got this technology could we bring it down and do an experiment with him to see what it would be like on the brain? Because he was the, the guru, the authority on stimulating the brain. So if we thought if anybody knew how to do it appropriately, it would be him. That's, that's, yes, and I, I recall very well your trip down to London to demonstrate it. And I recall the same as you in, in great detail, the moment when Merton rang me up, insisted that I come along immediately and have my brain stimulated by you uh, with, the, with the magnetic stimulator. And for me, that was amazing. It was a simple, painless way of activating the brain. And I believe when you came down to London, you must have done it on, on quite a large number of people in Queen Square. It was, uh, I think it's fair to say, really quite an exciting day. You don't have many days in a career where something sort of transformational takes place. And it was immediately obvious when we, we stimulated Pat's brain um, and his response to it that something of interest had occurred. And he made a few telephone calls, including to yourself. And I don't know if you recall, but by the end of the day, his laboratory and the corridor outside was completely yes. full of people. And they were all lining up in. <laughs> so we could stimulate their brains. Because you don't often have moments like that in science where hundreds of people, or dozens of people flock in to look at a new technique that's been demonstrated for the first time. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was the beginnings of something you could see would have amazing uh, implications, as, it, as indeed it has had. Well, well, indeed, and, and you were very prescient in, in, in realising that. Oh, but you wrote to me literally the next day after that demonstration saying how amazing you had found it and could you possibly have a sim stimulator yes. as soon as possible? <laughs> Did you just go away immediately and write this paper that you published eventually in The Lancet? Uh, what was the progress of getting the whole thing out into the community? Demonstrating in Queen Square was a good start, but how, how did you go on after that? So I, I gave it a little bit of thought as to whether TMS was worthy of publication, but, but Pat Merton was insistent that we wrote something about it. So about a month after the original demonstration, we wrote this brief letter to the, to the Lancet. Um, like all the best papers, it was one page long, and, 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 and absorbed about 10 years of research into that one page. And, and we said, it's effectively said, we didn't really know if anybody was interested, but we could stimulate the brain painlessly and non-invasively. And Lancet, somewhat to my surprise, were very keen to publish it. They, within about a couple of weeks, they'd written back to me and said, we're, they were keen to publish it. And 
could they could we send them a photograph of the stimulator if it wasn't too dull i think was the phrase that they used so they they published it within i don't know two or three weeks three weeks something like that of when we'd submitted it um and Somewhat to my surprise, there was quite a lot of interest in it. In fact, I think it's fair to say there was a lot of interest in it um, because it, it was in the days of postal mail, paper mail. And I used to get literally sack loads of mail, sack loads of mail delivered to my office nearly every day from people all over the world who said, we, we've seen this article, we're really interested in it. And could they have a stimulator, please? The, the one we demonstrated at Queen Square was literally the only machine in the world that was able to do TMS because we were very keen for the technique to get out there so people could see if it really was useful. Um, but we couldn't be manufacturers for the whole world of TMS machines. But we decided that we'd, we'd use the entire resource of my electronics lab for about one year to build six um, versions of a, a new design of stimulator that was much more sort of user friendly and we distributed those at cost price just to groups mainly in the UK but at least one in America and we thought well that'll be an end of it there's half a dozen machines out there there'll not be a need for any more but the, the the mail kept coming in and we decided that we'd have to engage with some sort of commercial venture um, we did make the decision not to patent it though because my personal view was that it would restrict the take up of the technology if one tried to protect it. And I'm not a great fan of, on, on I guess, moralistic grounds of protecting mm. medical equipment from other people making it and helping others. We put our university hats on and licensed out the technology that we'd got to a company called Nova Metrics Inc. in the States. Mike Polson happened to be working for them at the time. So he was our contact through the company and the company started making them at their factory in Wales. They had a little manufacturing capability in Wales, which a few years later took part in a management buyout and went its own way from Nova Metrics and became the Magstim company. Can you tell us how or who came up with the figure of eight coil shape? It's one of these ideas one should have had oneself, but didn't. It, it was a guy called Professor Shugo Ueno in, I forget where, in Japan now, who, who published a brief paper saying a figure of eight coil had certain useful characteristics over a circuit core. And of course it does, because, because it's two coils side by side, it induces two current loops like that, which add in the middle. So you get twice as much current in the middle of that configuration as you do anywhere else. And that gives a degree of spatial selectivity in that you're more likely to be stimulating in the middle of that configuration than you are elsewhere around the perimeter. But yeah. it wasn't our idea, I'm sad to say. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that was an idea that wasn't patented as well, I, th I think, yeah. So we've got all this basically free. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a personal thing, I think, uh, in, in, in a simplistic way of putting it. The, the ultimate issue there with medical devices is you say to a sick person, I have got this device which can help you. If you don't give me money, you can't have it. And whilst, you know, I, I, in, in the real world, it's often like that. I, I prefer to not be in that camp. So it was a luxury I could sort of afford. <laughs>